Seeing our speaker today, Professor Shri Vishwanathan. Perhaps it's superfluous, an introduction, but an influential mind like Shiv's has influenced people in different ways. And in a sense, every introduction is a personal introduction of how a thinker has influenced people. And I consider myself fortunate to have encountered Shiv's writing some 20 odd years ago. That's one reason. The second thing is, there is an introduction is also necessary or useful because there is a larger question that I find important, which is when does an academic's voice begin to be heard? Especially, when does dissonance begin to sound like music? Shiv is one of those thinkers who I believe is interdisciplinary in a way that an insight travels across issues, across problems. You can find similar mind, a similar idea, a similar critique crossing the boundaries of specific problems. You can hear the same question being asked on numbers of issues. In that sense, I find uh, Professor Vishwanathan's writings to have uh, a strong echo in one particular kind of a mind which likes to look at diverse questions, diverse issues with a critical spirit. The other, perhaps more important mind, question to my mind is, why is it that certain kinds of ideas, certain critiques are now, today, surfacing and finding a much broader receptivity among people than they did, say, 25 years ago. I've been in this development field for 25 years, and Professor Vishwanathan has been there for about 35 years now, maybe a little less or more, you know. And many of the things that he said 25 years ago were, were very narrow audience. A large number of people are listening to those, circumstance, those things today. Circumstances have changed. I see that in my own narrow field, is in a much larger field. Two different kinds of explanations can be. One is the standard Conian kind of explanation that uh, science goes in spurts and leaps and certain transitions are taken place and people begin to move from one paradigmatic kind of understanding to another. That could be part of the explanation. The other part is that circumstances have changed today ecological and social circumstances have changed today. And it is not that I'm arguing that circumstances determine ideas, but people become more amenable to listening to certain kinds of ideas as situations and circumstances change than they were, say, 25 years ago. Professor Vishwanathan's work encompasses a very wide sweep, ranging from ecology to politics to ethics, sociology. I would therefore see today's lecture, look forward to today's lecture, in a way that you find it very rare of thinkers who cross not just disciplines but who cross other kinds of boundaries. I am therefore extremely fortunate today to have him and uh, my job is to introduce him. I shouldn't turn this into a summon.
or an excess of excitement. I request Professor Vishwanath, therefore, to come and make his talk. Thank you, Purnendu. I think things are changing. When an anti-developed man is asked to speak on development, either anti-development is becoming respectable or development is becoming problematic. In fact, when Chandan Gowda invited me to give a talk on development, I virtually begged off. I said, why development? It's boring, it's textbookish, it's premji. And he said, but that's what we do. And I said, God, who wants to speak on a textbook topic that everyone's bored stiff with? And then I suddenly remembered that I come from a state where the chief minister is called Mr. Development. He should have been actually called Mr. Genocide, but that's a different point. But then it's right that a man who's so responsible for genocide can get away because he believes in development. Development becomes an act of erasure. And then you come to Bangalore and found several of these Mr. Developments as if they're Mr. Universes, from Narayan Murthy to what have you. And you start wondering, what is this topic which has eliminated theme, this word, this verb which has eliminated so many people and performs genocide in the name of economics, yet gets the approval of everyone from Narendra Modi to Narayan Murthy? There must be something fascinating about it. And what I'm going to do today is to try to give a left-handed tribute to development. That's the furthest I can go in my claim to respectability and to textbook scholarship. And development is a real survivor as a term. Four terms have survived the 20th century in different ways. Science, the nation, maybe not without the nation state, democracy, and development. And of these terms, development seems to have the biggest constituency. And that intrigues me. How can such an innocuous, idiotic term based on historical illiteracy survive and get the approval of so many people, so much so that Mr. Amartya Sen has to talk about development as freedom, and Arjun Sen Gupta has to voice the idea of the rights to development. These are stunning brains, some of the finest minds of the century, and yet they seem to show a commitment to this antiseptic, genocidal term. And I said, how do I go about it without repeating what I've said for 30 years? Because as Purnendu said, the first claim to respectability is when you repeat yourself to boredom. He for 25 years, me for 35. So let me try something different. Uh, is there some way of coaxing this to a certain... How does one look at development? And I thought, let's abandon economics. I'm pretty good at it, but I'm pretty bored with it. Having served time at the Delhi School of Economics for 10 years, it sort of immunizes you to economics. And then I said, can I see development as a novel? I like the paradox. Because development is actually the destruction of storytelling, constructed as a modern narrative. Development, can development be visualized as a novel? And in one of those lazy classes when I actually hid from my students, I was reading Andre Gide's Counterfeiters. Brilliant novel. In fact, it's a novel within the novel where the man actually tries to explain that he's writing a novel about a novel, but which has no characters because all the characters are economic ideas. Exchange, reciprocity, contract. And the beauty of Jeet's Contrafeeters is it, the classic hero of the book is not a character, but a concept. And development in that way is the novel of the 20th century. It is the career of the concept as hero. And that struck me as absolutely stunning. Because if you look at the history of development, it is actually the destruction of storytelling. Development, in fact, is based... Look at the standard creation myth of development. That suddenly out of the blue, one year in somewhere around 47 or 49, President Truman, I love the thing, 
the man who decides to drop the bomb also decides to drop the bomb called development. Decides that development is what needs. Truman is an Old Testament man. And in a biblical way he says, America represents the sign of grace. And instead of 12 apostles, you have 14 nations who have reached an intermediate level of development. And the rest, us, are underdeveloped. A fascinating Old Testament theology. A theology of illiteracy, but a theology of America. And it becomes the sacred document of the world. It outlasts the Cold War. It outlasts the debates on science. And it's based on a destruction of two kinds of storytelling. It's based on a theft of history. It assumes till then that any other theory of change has been irrelevant. And it assumes that the West is the peak of the development story. As Jack Woody pointed out, development is the theft of history. It's the destruction of all other forms of history, all other kinds of myth-making, where you create one standardized, homogeneous, antiseptic policy concept to destroy all the other forms of storytelling. You create a text which destroys the orality of the other theories of change. Development. And secondly, you create a distorted view of history by preempting the future, by saying that from now on, America is the goal, it has developed, we are all underdeveloped, so history of the future from now on is an unraveling of stages from our underdevelopment to their development. And to begin perversely, the best way to challenge development is to tell you three stories. The first is a story that was told to me by the Indian Spanish philosopher Raimundo Panikar. Hey, can I borrow a glass of water? I love disrupting audiences. And Panikar tells, tells the story of a Texan who meets an American tribal, an American Indian as they call him. And the Texan, full of his hats, goes up to the Indian and says, we have developed beyond you. And the Indian says happily, I'm glad we are both where we are. The second story, and it's by Richard Krapusinski, about the Emperor Haile Selassie, who suddenly discovered the idea of development. And Selassie, always being ceremonial and ritually perfect, declares the R of development. In that one hour, he would declare dams to be opened, statues to be installed, so you had a million foundation stones and no project. And the third story, much more poignant, is about the outstanding human rights activist, Mark Munzel. Munzel wrote a stunning report of genocide in Paraguay. And he talks about the destruction of the Ake Indians. And the governments of Paraguay destroyed the Ake Indians by refusing them the right to their music. The society disintegrates. Munzel goes before the United Nations and makes an appeal. And the Brazilian and Paraguayan ambassadors admit that there has been genocide. And then they add, almost bureaucratically and diplomatically, that it was part of the logic of development. A lovely antiseptic obituary to a forgotten Indian. Three stories of development of the theory. It's first bad geography and it's a bad history of time. And how can bad geography and bad history of time be thought of and taught in our universities? I mean, it's like creating respectability around illiteracy at its worst. And India is a great propounder of the right to development. It's a paradox that we have to answer because today it's not just a paradox of the ethics of democracy, it's a paradox of the very ethics of freedom that we are confronting. Whether it's the Narmada Dam, whether it's the debate on biotechnology, whether it's the question of the nuclear complex, many of you have been involved in it, we bear the burden of what I call the treason of development as the treason of our intellectuals. But let's be open to development. To 
tolerance and pluralism are the order of the day. Can we construct development in a different way? My favorite literary critic, Michael Bakhtin, makes a difference between the old style novel, which was monologic and which was recorded only in the singularity of the author's voice, and the new polished semi of the novel, which was multi voiced. For example, his example is Dostoevsky where Dostoevsky's characters were not only ridden with internal contradictions, with inner voices talking to each other, but to a certain extent the character of the person was created through a congruence of confluent voices. There was no one authorial voice. There was a heterogeneity, or what we call a heteroglossia. Can development be polysemic? In the initial phases, no. You know, I still remember the time development experts like Douglas Emsinger used to go around Ford Foundation. Emsinger was the viceroy of development, and he used to reach Ford Foundation in a chariot. Even Nehru didn't indulge in such costume activities. But in a way, it captured the lifestyle of what these people wanted and what they were trying to suggest. How does development as a novel begin? It begins with the theory of lack. Lag. We are lagging behind some nation, some state, some people. Of course, in this case, very similar, simply, we are lagging behind the myth called America. Then you move from lack, lag to lack. There's a general feeling, and here you need expert consultants. Development can never do without expert consultants. You, without expert consultants, development as a concept would die. It would lose its grammar, its illiteracy. The availability of dialects would surface without the standardized voice of the consultant. You know, I remember my favorite consultant, David McClellan. He used to visit the Ford Foundation in Delhi. And McClellan felt that fishermen lacked what he called NAC. NAC is a beautiful formula. It means need for achievement. And McClellan constructed a study around fishermen to find out that the minute they got what the money they required, they had to spend it happily on booze, buy a radio, and refuse to work further. And he had to synthesize this phenomena. Out of this was born NAC. I remember we used to do our MA in sociology questions, and NAC was one sure question in every developmental paper. But sometimes I wondered about the fate of these people. Bert Hoselitz used to edit economic development and cultural change. Inadequacy it saw in other societies, it now sees within itself. And from the 60s, development was always a hyphenated concept. You had community development, you had local development, you had sustainable development, you had later human development. Development could never move without the hyphen. I've never seen a concept which has been saved so many times with the aid of a hyphen. But before I move to the development of the age of the hyphen, let me look at two characters who represented development. The first was Richard Lilienthal. Richard Lilienthal had a tremendous career. He was head of the TVA, chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, and the first consultant as Mr. Development. Lilienthal was a brilliant man. A stunning lawyer who worked for the passage of the TVA bill. And yet he spent all his last few years as Mr. Development, as the leading private consultant in development, defending the Shah of Iran. When history had proved the perfidy of the Shah of Iran, Lilienthal's diaries still say that he was committed to development. What is it about this term? that allows for any form of violence, legitimizes any kind of torture, and yet sees itself as a genuine act of economics. Forget the critics of Elie Chanandi. Their poetry can't work on the prose of development. Stunning, brilliant brains which have haunted our imagination. But when it comes to the prose of development, the work of these brilliant minds is almost ineffective. And it's at this point that I want to look at a second character. Who was the second Mr. Development? Robert McNamara, president of Ford, head of the Vietnam Project as Secretary of Defense, 
and then president of World Bank. He was the other incarnation of Mr. Development. And McNamara thought of Vietnam as a developmental project. He built the entire Vietnam project as a developmental issue and then carried the same ideas on to the World Bank. Brilliant men, brilliant consequences. You say dams are the temples of modern India and then you create more refugees from dams than from all the wars we have fought. Development people love statistics. The statistics of dam displacement is stunning. Of course, it's closely followed today by the statistics of riot displacement. But between dams and riots, we managed to create a country of internal refugees. All in the name of development. It's a fascinating term. It's a drama of its own. And literature has not been honest, consistent with it. It creates a politics of genocide we haven't yet understood. And yet, we all want to join the institutes of development. Social science is constructed around institutes of development. I work for one called the Center for Developing Societies, which tried to unburden its conscience by being a critic of development. It haunts us. Look at it today. Start with my own new institute, the Ambani Institute of Technology, established in the name of development, not to be left far behind. The Premji Institute, which claims it's a university for development, when actually it doesn't even understand the idea of the university. It's a polytechnic for development. Now, let's be fair. If you want to take the critique of development, let's take it where we belong, to us. Before, before we save the people from development, let's save ourselves from the tyranny of that concept. I know most of my friends are already cursing me in the audience saying, that chap is back to his old game. But that's where we begin. Because if an institute like Premji or an institute like Ambani's or Narayan Murthy or throw in all the half the corporations you want, which are philanthropizing development today, they need a genealogy of the concept. They need to exorcise it. They need to bring back an ethics of freedom and an ethics of memory into development. Otherwise, all you have is a, a polytechnic which substitutes applied science for ethics. And that's all we are as research institutes for development. We substitute one illiteracy with another illiteracy to destroy not just the idea of the university, but to compound the hegemony of development. Let me push it a bit further. The drama proceeds. Development suddenly acquires a certain kind of tolerance. And we discover sustainable development. I love the word. I remember the first time I met Mr. Kuldeep Singh, who was a judge of the Green Court. And I asked him casually, Kuldeep Sahib, how did you discover sustainability? And in his typical Punjabi way, he taught me something. Sustainability is a career. Like Edward Said said, Orientalism is a career. He said, I came back from London. Everyone had taken over human rights. There was no space in human rights. Then I discovered this kitab, a Brundtland report. I found my career, sustainability. I'm not being skeptical. I'm saying the way we sometimes inherit concepts, we give them new careers, new possibilities. But no one looks at the fact that sustainable development is actually an oxymoron. We are a society of oxymorons. Sustainable development. It's the new goddess. But who examines the contradictions in it? I mean, let's just take the contradictions of sustainability. It separates nature from justice. So if you protect nature, you might actually be violating the norms of justice. Two, it separates nature as the best things from how nature is the rest live out. So actually, nature is not one word. It has to be a series of dialects. But sustainability has no grammarian, no translator to look at what nature means in each of these societies. Nature to a biotechnologist is not nature to a sustain, subsistence farmer. It's a simple fact on which half of India collapses. 
Let's push it further. Sustainability cannot differentiate between efficiency and sufficiency. So what you have in the problem-solving situation, I love the word problem-solving. Institutes and managements love it. Sustainability is a problem-solving situation. But what if we solve? We create a technical design. We think if we improve the efficiency of the car, we have solved the problem of lifestyle and livelihood. So we have efficiency, but not sufficiency. And we push it further. What we also do then, it's a classic thing. We eliminate the idea of survival and subsistence, and we talk of a new word. Oh, it's a beautiful word. It's called eudaimonia, well-being. And as Zygmunt Bauma said, well-being is a non-utopian, shy way of expressing your wish for the future. Eudaimonia comes when you have gone beyond the logic of survival to the logic of the middle class. Eudaimonia comes when the middle class is ready to forget the issues of survival. Eudaimonia. As someone told me, it's Greek. I bet it's Greek. It's a Greek that forgets the value of subsistence and survival. And eventually, sustainability did something which I think most people didn't notice. It philanthropized development. Sustainability was the word with which corporations could enter development. Corporations which wanted to be socially responsible, I love the term, as much as sustainability, could be both sustainable and socially responsible. But what did it mean? in terms of an ethics of freedom? What did it mean in terms of the new democratization of democracy? These are questions we are afraid to ask or answer. Pierre Duhim once said that the best way a scientific paradigm can save is to build an epicycle around itself. When you don't want to face the truth, you create a second constellation of illusions. Development is a master of epicycles. So we move from sustainability to human development. But there's a tremendous poetry to human development. In fact, it was built by my favorite economists, Mehub al Haq. And Haq was genuinely concerned about freedom. Haq was genuinely believed in challenging what he called the World Bank consensus on development. Haq wanted a different kind of storytelling. And for an economist to want a different kind of storytelling is a lot. He wanted something beyond the World Bank narratives. He wanted to construct a different narrative. A narrative which began with people and reflected people's choices. Huck was a brilliant man. And he surrounded himself with brilliant men. And of course a brilliant wife. Amartya Sen, Khadija Huck, Meghnath Deshai, for all the idiocy of his later work on Narendra Modi, all of them developed the idea of human development. And they created a beautiful concept which went beyond economics, which went beyond the language of GNP, which went and tried to understand what Amartya Sen later said, that development has to be a part of the theory of freedom. But I think the problem was this. Can a theory of rights account for a theory of development? Because rights is anchored on the idea of the individual. Development needs the solidarity of the group. How do you create a human rights of development which understands both? And to a certain extent, the semiotic of the idea is important. I wonder if any of you have seen a human development report. It's an innocuous looking colorful workbook with little box-like narratives, a bit like a model science class which tells you the successful stories, gives you pie charts as indicators. The nature of the narrative is important because it actually tells you it's solving a problem when it is actually seeing the problem as unsolvable. There's one paragraph on globalization of crime. I thought crime at least deserved a story in itself. What is it about the nature of these narratives that oversimplifies, 
turns them into a semiotic monstrosity. And I think it's important to answer that we as middle class people need to challenge the way we construct the stories. Because the destruction of the story is the beginning of the violence of development. And when you appropriate stories into these little cozy narratives with indicators, pie charts and little successful stories, I think you destroy the idea of development. By the time development was opening up to an idea of freedom under the work of Amartya Sen, Arjun Sen Gupta and some of the early ideas economists, the nature of evil had changed. Globalization had come into being and globalization had altered the very idea of violence. Because remember, if globalization worked anywhere, it was in the globalization of crime. Crime was the thing that really got globalized. And that's why I love watching Anna Hazare. You know, when crime is being systematized, you think corruption has to be individualized. No one attacks the systematic nature of corruption. All you're asked is to take oaths saying, I will not pay a bribe. But the individuality, the biography of reforming corruption at an autobiographical level cannot face the systemic nature of the transformation. Crime has taken over the world. And what, do we, what does development say about the globalization of crime? Just gawking at a football picture of Dawood Ibrahim at a cricket match won't do. You have to look at the nature of human trafficking. You have to look at the nature of defense deals. You have to look at the fact that millions of kids are today child soldiers. That's also development. And where do we have the language or the literacy to speak about this kind of violence? And yet, Mr. Modi to Narayan Murthy loved the concept of development. That gives three possibilities. I am a fool, quite likely despite my thesis. Two, there is an illiteracy and innocence to these people which needs to be challenged if the democratic imagination is going to survive. An unpleasant task. But one has to do it. Because we are faced now with two other problems. The problem of risk and the problem of obsolescence. Globalization has changed the idea of the welfare state. The nation state has been abandoned because the welfare state has been destroyed. Today, full employment is no longer a goal of modern economics. We are, to use the new word, redundant. We are obsolescent. When you lose your job, you no longer belong to the unemployed, you belong to the unemployable. You're obsolescent. And development has no ethics of obsolescence. Development has no answer to people who actually fade from history. Earlier we talked of defeated knowledges. Today we have to talk of defeated people who have no claim to history, no claim to the future. Of course, you can be, you know, in the old time, you know, when you had scientific management, you had the human relations school. When you have development, you have the NGOs coming and trying to act as humanizers of development. But we have to, since all of us have been NGOs at some time or the other, we have to ask whether our attempt to humanize development is mainly a kind of basic applied science or a true response to combining the ethical and the political. If so, what's the difference in the nature of narrative? Unpleasant questions, which make us turn guiltily around to see whether there's someone else in the audience who's feeling that way. But that's where we begin. We begin with a critique of the best on development. The CSDS, the Premji Institute, Isaac, Delhi School of Economics, great institutes, which forgot to be great institutes at the time of democratic crisis. Let's start with the elite. Because the elite is knowledge proof when it comes to questions of violence, when it comes to questions of genocide, when it comes to questions of ethics. We are eliminating people. Thousands disappear during the flood every year. There's no obituary for them. Thousands disappear during disasters of every kind. There's no obituary for them. 
Thousands disappear with every change in technology. Who cares? We don't even classify them in the revenue village. And if you're outside the revenue village, you don't exist. You can even go one step further. If you don't have a ration card, you're not a victim. So most of the victims of the Bhopal gas disaster were not victims because they had no ration cards. They were obsolescent. They don't exist, exist within the classificatory system. And that's the point I want to make. Development is an act of classification which spends its time excluding people so it can include a few people later. It practices inclusion after creating a structure of exclusion. It's classificatory genocide built on a false historiography of time and a distorted geography called cartography. It's time we face up to the facts. We have too many Mr. Developments. I like the masculinity of the term, Mr. Development, like Mr. Universe. Ripples muzzling, muzzles rippling with GNP no doubt. And then you come to the last part. At the very time you want to rescue development, science collapses on you. Oh, you don't need the old critique of science because suddenly you face risk. Risk is what happens when science can no longer work and guarantee certainty. Science in uncertain conditions faces the fact that you can no longer predict most scientific activities in complex conditions. Risk is the uncertainty of a science which can no longer be Newtonian. So development faces risk on one side, development faces the ethics of obsolescence on the other side, and we neither have a cognitive system to understand science, nor do we have an ethical system to understand the cost of development. It's a beautiful time of celebration as we keep on establishing new institutes for corporate social responsibility for development. We exaggerate the nature of the ethical crisis. We are not victims, ladies and gentlemen. We are perpetrators of a crime called development and its main beneficiaries. If you want to democratize democracy, let's begin here with you and me. Otherwise, we continue happily, as Bollywood would say, in the name of development. Heil Hitler. as thoughtful a talk as this, I would uh, invite those who are here to ask questions. And uh, Professor Vishwanath has said that he would uh, enjoy it today. But uh, please, uh, Shiv, would you mind coming up here? Murthy, and I'm a PhD student at uh, Center for the Study of Culture and Society, CSCS. Fortunately, no development there. Um, but I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, if you look at development as violence, my question to you then is, what is the alternative to development? I mean, one way of imagining it is thinking of development alternatives, which I think uh, that's not the position that you're taking. So if that's not the position you're taking, then what's the alternative to development? That's one question. Okay. Simple. Ordinary language has changed. All societies have a version of good and bad, but doesn't have to be reduced to the monologue of a development sequence. Second, and not for development alternatives. What I'm saying is sometimes social science in using its language should actually try to use the power of ordinary language. And I think by going back to it, we might develop a poetry of new set of concepts, which is more open to the kind of understandings we're looking for. At a second level, we don't know. We have been under the hegemony of development for so long, so we either talk about Modernity, alternative modernity, development, alternative development. No, I think the dream of alternatives has to go beyond the hegemony of the term because it just becomes an alternative hyphenation. We have to think differently. We're still too much at a new stage. But I think a lot of ordinary people have already thought beyond us. I'll go back and do some listening. And maybe arrogant experts like me need to do more listening. You know, because I'm, I'm not just the analyst, I'm also the case study. 
I was a part of the Center for the Study of Developing Societies. I'm part of the Ambani Institute. We are analysts. Therefore, we are case studies. Second question. Okay. Uh, can I play devil? Higher development. I mean, uh, is that an assumption uh, that you're making? Because um, it I, think, I think the people want development. But what is that development? Is it articulated in the same language? Uh, when people say the example, suppose people who are fighting biotechnology say they want a different kind of development. Are they talking only of development? Or are they talking about agriculture? And if they're talking about agriculture, are they talking about a different way of life? So then what you have is a different set of vocabularies where life, lifestyle, livelihood, life cycle knits together in a different thesaurus of words. Now you, you might say that's too rudimentary. It's too naive. But let's begin with naivet. I think a lot of politics begins with naivet. And Naivet has done a pretty good job in biotechnology. I don't know whether you would ex accept that, but it just began with that. With people saying, you're not experts. I said, fine, we're not experts. We're people who think. And started thinking, we realized we knew more than the expert who was the development expert. And after all, look, it's a perfect case of this thing. I mean, after all, look at what happened. The crisis was M.S. Swaminathan, father of the Green Revolution, who's also statesman of sustainable development, and suddenly he realizes that he's caught in this thing. He can't afford the word development. So he puts in every little prefix possible. Woman in development, nature in development, justice in development, environment in development, anything into the bad bag called development to save development. But suppose you've taken all these terms and tried to understand the imaginations behind them. Something that's begun with a lot of activists. I think a different narrative was being born. And in a way, you might say I'm a fundamentalist like Ivan Illich, good company, but I think sometimes fundamentalism is a good way to survive development, provided it doesn't get too communist in the later stages. Yeah, which? I think if you look at the original language of shifting cultivation as a cosmology, I think what a friend of mine told me, shifting cultivation has 23 different kinds of time. How many kinds of time does sustainable development have? Five? The richness of vocabulary is the richness of a different kind of cosmos. True, today with demography you could get a different kind of shifting cultivation. Shifting cultivation in fact is the wrong term. That itself is a developmentalist term. But there have been dreams of this kind of world. And to a certain extent, even groups like Gandhi worked on it. In fact, I would say read it in Hind Swaraj would come close to my idea of development. No. Difficult. I can think of individuals. I can think of works. I can think of many people who have thought about it. I can think of many movements approximating this idea. I think the seeds of this were present in the anti dam movement at a particular point of time before it went a bit wonky. Seeds of it could be prevent in the attempt to preserve agriculture against biotechnology. It can be a resist power of resistance, but I hope that resistance becomes something more creative. Maybe in these little moments, we have to look for our freedom. But, you know, as Max Weber once said, maybe freedom is only available in the crevices of tyranny. Some creative aspects. Sorry? You dealt with cliches about development. Yeah, the creativity comes from the fact we still believe in it of development to the second cliche. So you move from community development to local development, local development to sustainable development. Each one was a creative move which involved some of the most creative science, social scientists and scientists of that time. The problem is it moved from cliche to cliche but at every moment of new discovery it was seen as creativity. Human development, the excitement around it was stunning. Look at the group we assembled. Outstanding brains. Where is it now? Sustainable development. What a beautiful word. And there is Bo Brundtland saying, I wish I could write another book like that. I'm wondering whether this allows for the kind of creativity we are talking about. Because creativity eventually gets reduced to cliche by the very nature of the paradigm. And that flaw demands that we look at other things, explore other things, possibilities. And it sounds vague. But let's begin with the vagueness and naivete of the thing. 
Because all of us have lived through the development paradigm for years. And if communism could fall, maybe the Berlin walls of development might fall someday. Unless we rebuild them as research institutes. Which is going to tempt you to work at it again and again. And that's part of the seduction of development. Hey, maybe I can try better. Maybe I can do better. I can, I, and I sympathize with that. I mean, every time you object to nuclear, I'm sure the scientist is telling me, look, this time it will work better. I, I'm sure you've experienced that proposition. I'm Vaishali from Bangalore University. Um, you also talked about the notion of development as false historiography. So, uh, what kind of a non-hegemonic or counter-discursive historiography uh, is possible and where would it come from and what are the milestones and how would you chart this kind of... It must history? come within scholarship itself. But though eventually he acknowledges the uniqueness of the West. I think it comes from various kinds of storytelling, folklore, cosmology. I mean, let's take a simple thing. Can you write a history of agriculture that doesn't begin from traditional times and reaches the Green Revolution? Can you break that linearity and think of what made us produce 50,000 varieties of rice and more as 50,000 varieties of dreaming? If you can write a history of rice in that way, which combines cooking, dreaming, mythology, you might have an alternative historiography, which doesn't begin with the traditional farmer and ends with M.S. Swaminathan. To take the best of them. No, let's take it. This man is brilliant. And he's outlasted. It's probably the, in terms of longevity, the most powerful science policy expert of the era. So the last time I said it, some of the audience walked out. Now, when you say the goal is America, uh, again, my discomfort with your position uh, seems to be that it um, ends up being a dichotomous way of thinking. So it's like the West, uh, non-West, okay. or modernity versus tradition. And I'm sort of wondering whether you are romanticizing tradition to some extent, and there can be violence in tradition as well. Yeah. So what would your uh, answer was, be to that? I was waiting for that. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, first, no romanticism. I like being a romantic. I love Bollywood. But that doesn't mean I can't be pragmatic also. Let's face it, the Indian national movement in its debates on science and technology actually created the possibility of a number of other Wests combining with a number of alternative Indias. In medicine, in agriculture, organic farming was discovered in India, invented at Indore and re-exported back. An alternative idea of planning was discovered by Patrick Geddes and reconstructed. I'm talking of very pragmatic, very theoretical sciences. And in fact, we combined also with the possibility, I mean, let's take something. The first association to establish science in India, the Indian Association of Cultivation of Science, had a beautiful goal to rescue science from Western civilization. And it is not refined. We realized the importance of other Wests, we played with the possibility of other colonialisms. Simple example. Everyone talks of Alan Octavian Hume as the father of the Indian Congress. He was 19th century's greatest ornithologist. The man who edited Stray Feathers before it was taken over by Salim Ali. Theosophists. Maria Montessori interned in India. Starts the Montessori system of education. Nikolai Rorik comes to India and starts the idea of the Green Cross, which was not accepted by the UNESCO. The idea that you could have a green cross like the Red Cross to rescue cultural monuments during times of war. Brilliant ideas. All from the other West. So I'm quite happy to handle these kind of questions because I think we've gone beyond them. We are plural as an act of imagination and as a theory of survival. So if you still feel we are romantic, I can live with that. If India is residual, hmm? Uh, is partly this romantic uh, uh, question. Can I, I stop you there? India is a composed heap of alternatives. Uh, in my own particular area of work, 
which is uh, pastoralism. Hmm? 25 years ago when I began my work, I was told that the Indira Gandhi Canal is coming hmm. and pastoralism will disappear. Hmm. Hmm? Agriculture is spreading into all the dry land areas, pastoralism will here. Now I find that over a period of 25 years, there was a curve, but today you have a situation in which the IG canal is floundering, a particular vision of Stalinist large-scale technology is floundering. Hmm? Uh, the extension of agriculture is also reaching its close, its apogee is over. But you find that a system of livelihood built on resilience, opportunity, with a totally different logic of survival, aimed not at subsistence in the sense of being closed in autarkic, but subsistence in the other sense that it is not aimed at accumulation. It is part of market economies, definitely. That has grown, that has survived. And I see uh, an alternative vision emerging, not simply in the sense of going back to a residual or a past historical category, but people are inventing their own histories. Yeah, but I think residual India is not in the past, don't exist as an archive. They continue in forms of agriculture. When I say residual, I'm just meaning it's present there in contemporary India. Residues don't belong to the archive of the past. Residues belong to the present. And because they residues, the germs of possibilities, which are being continually invented every day. Every time I work in a disaster situation, I see forms of survival I couldn't dream of. The nature of the residual might change, you see. Absolutely. Yes, that's what I, I'm, I'm not saying that. everything yeah. is going to win. Mm. A lot of it is going to be eliminated. But you have to wager that something of you is going to survive. If that is romantic, so be it. No, no, I, I'm taking your question very seriously. You, maybe it needs a touch of romanticism. And when you watch some of these people survive, it's quite impressive. And you're caught in contradictions you can't understand. I'll give you an example. For a secular brain like me, I can't stand the fact that the RSNs and Anand Mag are some of the best survival experts. I've worked with them. They tick in a way I don't understand. A secular brain like me only got asthma at the end of it. They went home to their dinner. I, I'm, I'm saying we're facing with contradictions. It's much more than that. We are facing real problems. And let's be open-ended about some of the possibilities and how they're going to emerge. And that's why I don't like the word residual and romantic. Maybe you need a different vocabulary for the survival of these kind of societies. Even subsistence somehow sort of lowers the poetry of the thing. I mean, subsistence is a very anthropological term. It almost puts you into an evolutionary paradigm a bit later. Yeah. To work at the university, Arlington University. Uh, a bit louder, please. Yeah, can you? Hello. It's better. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So I work at Arlington University. Two sets of questions which are related, I think. Uh, one is that, uh, I think something is wrong with this. Try mine. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you just come up? Sir, I think this is a related question. First is that the set of problems that you seem to be laying at the door of, say, applied social sciences fields, right, like development economics. One can argue, like Sir Ferguson argues for anthropology, uh, they are actually inherent in social science theorizing. Mm. So how can one be romantic about, uh, uh, sorry, non-romantic about the idea of development and still be romantic about the idea of a university? One. Mm. Related to that is the fact that how can one talk about a demythalization de process, let's say, of development without a certain kind of demythalization of pain because that's the project of people like Illich and Gandhi the people in whose company you would want to keep in some sense, right? Yeah. Like without having a new imaginary of pain, discomfort. No, more than an imaginary of pain, a new imaginary of suffering. Suffering, pain, discomfort yeah, I think of we that need it. That's what development economics can't provide. No, but... No, wait, wait, wait. Let me take your question head on. I think to a certain extent what we are looking at, the kinds of suffering and the kinds of violence we are placing, violence is utterly inventive. In India from incest to terror from rape to genocide. How do you look at these forms of suffering? How do you look at the language for it? Maybe we don't know. Maybe sometimes you just have to go and sit next to a person who is suffering 
in silence to you know i remember this woman in the 84 riots told the and he was totally shattered by the 84 riots so he goes to this old woman and says i don't know what to do and she says in broken english beta mera duty rona hai tera duty sunna hai i can't think of anything more poignantly simple we have to look at suffering at that immediate level and the other question yeah i am a university romantic my best days were in the university and i think the university is being destroyed by a whole series of specialized institutes some of us were forced to go there but i think the return of the university as an imagination is very crucial without hyphens the inclusive university this is the new idrc project or the relevant university only thing is we have a moron in charge called kapil sibel who thinks technology investments and economic investments will bring about the nature of educational process in a different way it won't only thing is we don't have the guts to challenge him head on teachers should get up and tell him look altering the semester system of you know creating a tablet to bridge the alleged digital divide is not going to solve the problem of education but who are the representatives of education we are mom so you let all these guys get away with murder the murder of the university yeah i am an incurable romantic for the university i plead guilty romantics i think joining us today in this series of lectures organized by the azim premji university i invite you all for a cup of tea and some snacks that are served thank you